And so, Lord Christopher, you're obviously from England. Brexit's a massive topic yes. you know, that's affecting not only the UK, but many other countries, including Ireland and the EU, obviously. So how do you see that playing out in the next few months and weeks in particular with Boris Johnson? Well, that is a how long is a piece of string question. It's very difficult to say what will happen. The will of just over half the British people, including me, is that we should be allowed to become an independent country, which we always were and we'd like to be again, please. The opinion of just under half the British population and nearly all of the British establishment, this is the interesting thing, the British establishment has a complete contempt for the mere will of the mere smelly socks voters. They know best, people like Ken Clark, for instance, and uh, that communist fellow, what's his name, Corbyn, that's right, and his even more communist deputy, MacDonald. These people, they don't care what people think. They care only about advancing what they call socialism and we call communism and fascism. It's a kind of blend of communism and fascism which has gripped the left worldwide now, if I can use your word there. Um, and so these people, the totalitarian faction, let's call them that, or the legalists as the philosophers of early imperial China used to, used to call them the totalitarians, these people do not like the idea of democracy. They love the idea of things like the UN and the EU precisely because they are unelected. Yes, there is a Duma in Europe, the European Parliament, which is rather like the Duma of Kerensky. It's elected, but it has less power than the Duma of Kerensky. It has no power at all. It cannot even bring forward a bill. And I bet you there are quite a few people even watching this programme, and they'll be more, more well-informed than most if they watch this programme, who won't realise that the European Parliament, no member of the European Parliament has the right to table a bill in the European Parliament. Or repeat legislation. That can only be done by the unelected Commissar, but which is the official as, German name. As an Englishman, though, are you worried about Brexit at all, at all economically? How no, it might of be course not, out? because we, after all, uh, are one of the world's great trading nations. We used to run an empire that covered a quarter of the globe, on which the sun never set. We still retain very good links with what's now the Commonwealth, and we've now got countries applying to join the Commonwealth and have joined the Commonwealth who were never part of the Anglosphere in the first place. Places like Mozambique, they were, they were a Portuguese colony, they had nothing to do with us, but they applied to join the Commonwealth. Why? Because Britain has a place in the world which is unrivaled. We have excellent relations with individual European countries. We have excellent relations with the United States. We have excellent relations with the Commonwealth. We have connections around the world that are the envy of any other nation on the planet. So can we trade successfully? Yes, we can. And with the 60% of the world that is not European trade, we will carry on just as before, but we will eventually be able to make much more favourable trade deals with those that 60% of our trade, the rest of the world, than we are allowed to do under the European Union, which insists that it negotiates all trade deals for its member states. And as for the European Union, it's really very simple. They sell twice as much goods and services into the United Kingdom as we sell back to them. So, so they're to going whose to want, advantage they're, is it, they're going to want first to and foremost, to maintain a sensible, competent and continuous trading relationship after Brexit Day? The answer is them. If you try to hire a container to take goods from Britain to Rotterdam, it will cost you half the price of a container to take it from Rotterdam to Britain because that's one of the measures of how twice as much stuff is coming in from Europe as is going out to Europe. Mm -hmm. So we have much less to lose by the trade relationship with Europe breaking down altogether than they do. And though I understand that the commissars do not like the fact that the biggest payer into their coffers, which is Britain, is going to stop paying, whether they like it or not, and therefore they're trying to put every kind of childish obstacle in our way, the Irish backstop being the most ingenious, but actually the least important, um, because it's so easy to find a way of dealing with that sensibly. Um, 
they are going to have to accept if Boris Johnson gets his way and is able to give uh, the majority of the British people what we voted for by a larger margin and on, in a larger vote than on anything else we've ever voted for. He is going to try to make sure we get that. And of course, you ask the question about trade, the Europeans will adjust and adapt. And already the way we're approaching this, which is very sensible and is uh, very typical of Boris, rather than the civil service who are all busy writing and then leaking completely bogus reports about how there's going to be a shortage of pharmaceuticals and agricultural products are going to have massive tariffs and energy is going to conk out and, you know, whoa, whoa and thrice whoa. Boris's team are quietly getting in touch um, with their individual opposite numbers in the countries across Europe and even in among the commissars and they're saying to them, come on guys, let's be grown up about this. We supply pharmaceuticals to you. We don't want your people going sick because they can't get their medicines and vice versa. So let's do a micro deal on that before we get to Brexit. So you think day. deals are and that's done. what they're let doing. Me, let me put one other question yes. to you before we end. Yeah. What if this was to spell the breakup of the United Kingdom with Scotland potentially leaving to rejoin the EU and the North rejoining the South potentially? that that decision to leave the European Union could have major implications? Let me deal with the North and the South first. As I understand it from my friends among the unionist movement, there is no desire among the unionists to join the South. They would like to remain with the United Kingdom, and that's a pretty solid solid vote, I would think. But, so that I don't see happening. But at, no, well, at the same time, that's mm. only, it's actually less than 50% of the population of the North now, so that it's quite a distinct possibility if there was a border poll in the North that a majority would well, vote. Well, I'm a great one for saying, let I'll believe that when I see it. At the moment, I'm I a great man for it. democracy. Well, absolutely. I'm a great, but let I'll believe it when I see it. Uh, but uh, as to the Scottish one, well, there it's very simple. They've just discovered something which I researched with a, an eminent Scottish economist from London four years ago when we had the referendum on Scottish independence and the independence faction lost. They lost because we produced a 64-page paper that said this is what the economy of Scotland is going to look like within six months of no longer getting the English subsidies. And, was that project fair? And, and Scotland, no, that was, that was simply a straightforward calculation. It was absolutely responsibly done. Every number was sourced and carefully calculated and it was produced and, and we sent it to every member of the Scottish Parliament in such a way that whenever they downloaded it, we would know they were downloading it and reading it. Mm -hmm. And the SNP downloaded it and read it more often than everybody else. They got for the first time, like they were confronted with the fact that Scotland would be bankrupt within six months of leaving because they, instead of setting up a proper kind of free market, capitalist, low tax, small government area that could compete with the rest of the world on its own terms, and only then could you make Scotland genuinely independent, they had instead gone for the cap in hand model, let's go on taking as much subsidies from the English as we can get, and then suddenly realizing that if you stop getting the English subsidies, which you will if you become independent, then you can't make ends meet because you've structured the economy in a socialist, totalitarian way instead of a libertarian, low-tax, small-government, free-market way. This is a the, big mistake. But the outcome, really, in mm. my view, depends on the economic outcome of Brexit as to whether Scotland and the North will remain within the UK or not. Let us put it this way. I have no concerns whatsoever about the economic outcome of Brexit for various reasons. The first one is we're not going to have to pay 40 billion euros into the Europe's coffers, which there's no legal obligation on us to pay. They just demanded that of Theresa May, knowing that she was on their side and knowing she would give into it, which she promptly did, when I would have said, you can whistle for that unless you can prove a legal obligation on us to pay that before we leave, which they couldn't because there isn't one. And if they had said there was one, I would have said, right, we will go to international arbitration to get that verified. That's the first step, and, and Boris is playing much the same game as I would play, because he's done international negotiations before on behalf of Her Majesty's government, as have I. We know how this game is played. You don't go to them cap in hand. You sit there with your arms folded and say, come and do some shooting on my estate, and let's talk about this in a grown-up way. That's how it's actually done. Theresa May had no understanding of this. Boris knows how that game is played. He comes from the right kind of background to do this. He's got a very bright mind. So no, we're not going to suffer economically from Brexit. 
Inevitably, when you first make a change of this kind, there is a dislocation. You had to face that, as did we, when we joined the European Union and 60% of our trade was dislocated and had to be rearranged. Did we blub into our beards and say it couldn't be done? No, we just did it. Did it make any long-term disadvantage? No, it didn't. Was there any long-term advantage? For us, no, there wasn't. For you, yes, there was, because you were one of the poor four that put your cap out and said, fill this with money, please, and we all did. And that was very nice, and you're still doing very nicely out of that. But we were on the paying end of this, and on the paying end, we have a lot of very poor people now living in our inner cities in particular, and increasingly rural poverty as well. We can no longer afford to bankroll other countries via the European because Union. Because you've been net contributor for because some we, time. Because we've been, not, we've been a huge net contributor from the start. Mm -hmm. And we managed to get something of a rebate under Margaret Thatcher. But to buy a few favours, Tony Blair gave that away again. And so we're now far and away the biggest payers into the European Union. And we can no longer afford that. So we get an immediate, large, annual saving in cash terms. We also get the large capital saving we've talked of. We also get a regulatory saving in that, for instance, let's talk about all this global warming nonsense. At the moment, we're busy closing down our national uh, grid power stations, the, the proper ones that generate power from coal, which is the cheapest and most efficient, and these days the cleanest way to do it. And instead, we're, we're using these environmentally profoundly unfriendly windmills and solar panels where there are people in the uh, the mines where they, they get the coal for the batteries from, in the most appalling conditions, child labour. And every time you drive your electric car, you're killing a few children in the mines. And of course, this is the Greens think this is wonderful, but I don't. Mm -hmm. So we get free of all that. We can then start building coal-fired power stations again because they'll no longer be the EU telling us we can't. We can then generate electricity at one-sixth of the cost you can. And once we start doing that, we can bring down the cost of petrol as well for the same reason, because we're no longer going to have to pile these global warming taxes onto it. And we can get in that area and in many, many others enormous advantages by doing things cheaply rather than doing them expensively because some commissar has some sort of hang up about global warming or whatever other hang up he's got. And this freedom to do our own thing, make our own regulations where we think perhaps in some cases the European regulations aren't tough enough. I can think of one, which is the Grenfell uh, Tower Block, mm -hmm. where had we been able to enforce the British regulations, that building would not have burnt down. But the European regulations were, on, in that case, less stringent because a lobby group had bought the relevant commissar and therefore the regulations had been rewritten to suit the lobby group. And a lot of our citizens got killed because the European regulations were inadequate. So we will have the chance to put that right. So it goes in two directions. We can you, break so free of the, of, the, of the expensive majority of these regulations mm -hmm. and we can toughen up the few that need to be toughened up and run our own show. That's how democracy works. Mm -hmm. The European Union is fundamentally not just undemocratic, but anti-democratic. And that is why we want to leave because we want our democracy back and we are going to get it. And so you're very much looking forward to being a sovereign country again. What would you say though to Irish people who are watching this? And obviously the support for the European Union in, in Ireland is at an all time high, but would you be of the opinion that perhaps we should reconsider that stance? No, you see for the moment, you are making a lot of money directly out of being in the European Union. You are net gainers by but, well, being we, in. Well, we just became net contributors well, last up year. Well, up to a point, but you've been net gainers till now. And the point is this, you, you are, because you were such strong net gainers, people think that therefore being in the EU is good for you. Actually, I wouldn't be at all surprised. I haven't done the economic analysis for your country in the way that I did it for Scotland. Uh, but I'd be, I wouldn't be at all surprised to find that you would be vastly better off actually leaving the EU at the same time as us, which then solves the border problem, of course, straight away, because we can make our own arrangements without having to worry what the commissars think. And you could then trade freely with Europe and with the rest of the world. I mean, we're, we are, you know, the, at the moment Europe is saying, well, of course, we'll have to apply our tariff rules just the same to you as we will to any other third country. No, they don't. There's the European Economic Area, which we could rejoin, uh, should we wish to do so. 
uh, which has a tariff-free arrangement. There are two other models like that. Switzerland has something like that, not quite as good now. They've recently toughened up on it. Um, Norway has another. There are various models of trading with the EU that don't involve tariffs and don't involve having to pay for the wretched thing, don't involve being in all this pettifogging regulation, which is increasingly exasperating and impossible to comply with, and often, as we've seen with Grenfell Tower, inadequate. So you would benefit, I think, by a mature, independent, rational, economic assessment of whether, particularly if you have made the transition to being net payers in, whether you would now be better saying, thank you very much for the money, bye-bye.